Senator Milne. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. I rise today to speak in the strongest possible terms in support of the Defence Legislation Amendment Parliamentary Approval of Overseas Service Bill 2014, which inserts a new section into the Defence Act to require that decisions to deploy members of the Australian Defence Force beyond the territorial limits be made not by the executive alone, but by parliament as a whole. This means debate in both houses followed by a vote. Mr Deputy President, uh, there is no more serious thing that a government can do than to send Australian young men and women into battle to fight for our country, to put their lives on the line. And that's why it is important that this decision not stay just with the Prime Minister and the Executive, but be brought to the Parliament. It is particularly important that we have a strong debate and a, and a capacity for Parliament to do this in the current circumstances. Because if we don't learn from the past, then we will repeat the mistakes of the past. And I want to begin my contribution by reading from uh, the words of retired Major John Cantwell. He was our former commander in Afghanistan, and he has published a very moving book, Exit Wounds. And this is what he had to say. Is it worth it? I recall sitting in my office one day in 2010, soon after the repatriation ceremony for another dead Australian soldier. With me was one of the senior officers on my staff. We looked at each other and I said, you know what, mate, I'd never say this in front of the troops, but I'm starting to wonder if these deaths are worth it. My colleague replied, you're not the only one asking that question, boss. Some will argue that the men and women we send to war are all volunteers who know the risks and take them willingly. Others will say that casualties are the unavoidable cost of doing business in a combat zone. There is an argument that says the lives of a few sometimes need to be expended for a greater good. Another line of reasoning takes the grand strategic view of international affairs, putting the case that Australia, a relative minnow in terms of military might, albeit a well-trained and reasonable, well-equipped minnow, has no choice but to maintain strong bonds with a large and powerful friend, the United States. That friendship sometimes demands reciprocal payments in the form of going to war and spending some lives. A cold, clear-eyed analysis of these claims tells me that they're all true, much as it pains me to admit it. But these arguments only work at the intellectual level. They don't make sense at the human level, the level at which every life is precious, where every dead soldier is someone and not just a number. These men had parents, sisters, brothers, partners and children who loved them. They all had dreams and hopes and potential. These were the thoughts that ran through my head as I stood time and time in the morgue in the UAE. How could any of these lives be forfeited? What measures of success in the campaign to fight the Taliban and build Afghanistan's army could possibly warrant the grim procession of dead men that I supervised? I know absolutely that the men who died in Afghanistan were doing what they loved, with mates they respected, for a cause rejecting extremism, denying terrorism, helping a needy people, which is honourable. I also know that advances have been made in training the Afghan National Army and improving security in Uruzgan province. Some of the people of the province have also an improved quality of life. But will our efforts, no matter how impressive locally, significantly influence the myriad problems afflicting the government and the people of Afghanistan? Ten years from now, will anyone in Afghanistan remember? that Australians shed blood for them. For a man like me, a lifetime soldier inculcated with a sense of duty and service, these are difficult questions to confront. 
In the prologue to this book, I wrote that such thoughts seemed disrespectful, even treasonous. But the fundamental question has continued to gnaw at me. Is what we have achieved in Afghanistan worth the lives lost and damaged? Today, I know the answer. It is no. It is not worth it. I cannot justify any one of the Australian lives lost in Afghanistan. That was retired Major General John Cantwell. And I read that today in the context of where we are in a debate in this country about what is going on in Iraq. We have had the Prime Minister engaged in what can only be described as mission creep. We started out with humanitarian assistance, which the Greens totally support, taking water and food and uh, supply drops to people in desperate need. Then it went to engaged in a force where we were transporting weapons into northern Iraq. There was a lack of clarification at that point as to whether the Iraqi government had actually asked Australia to do that, and it's pretty clear now that the engagement had all been with the United States and that Australia was just going along following the United States in spite of the fact that President Obama has said there is no strategy. Then we went to having our Super Hornets placed on readiness to engage in airstrikes. Now we have an announcement overnight that there has been a general request to help with the conflict in Iraq. That is clearly asking to put Australia on notice to send our military forces into full engagement in Iraq. And yet this parliament has not had a fulsome debate. We have not heard from the Prime Minister what is the strategy. As Major General uh, Cantwell said in his uh, very profound uh, uh, book, you have to have a cold and clear-eyed analysis of what you are doing, whether it is worth it, what your strategy is, what are you going to achieve. And I don't believe there has been any of that. I don't believe the Prime Minister has set out the case. It is certainly true, absolutely true, that the atrocities being carried out by ISIS in Iraq are appalling, shocking. Nobody supports beheading as it has gone on. Nobody, has, nobody supports the gunning down of, in, of innocent people, of absolute uh, attempts to exterminate whole uh, villages and the like. But equally, we have to acknowledge that this is not something that is only going on from the Sunnis in the ISIS movement. The Shia militias, which are supporting the Iraqi government, have been carrying out the same atrocities for some time. In two, from 2005 to 7, we have seen exactly the same thing, and recently 70 or 80 people killed in a mosque. We have seen beheadings. We have seen the same brutality engaged with the militias, and now we are taking weapons to one part of the conflict, and no guarantee can be given that those weapons won't end up in the hands of the Shia militias. And then, if we succeed, and I hope we do, in using all our diplomatic power uh, to exert influence to make sure the new government in Iraq is inclusive, how do we know that the weapons we haven't transferred into northern Iraq won't be used by the Shia militias to turn on the new Iraqi government if it is inclusive of the Sunnis? This is the complicating factor, the, the re result of 2003 invasion of Iraq has meant that there has been a power vacuum in that country which has allowed the sectarian rivalries that have gone on for hundreds of years to actually be inflamed to a point that they are engaged in effectively a religious war against each other. And my question to the government has been what is the strategy here? And, the, and President Obama overnight has said that he wants to degrade ISIS, but he says that they can't be beaten. He has stayed out of Syria for three years. The Prime Minister says you can't stand by and watch atrocities happen. Well, we have. 
We have stood by and watched atrocities happen in Syria for three years. And these ISIS fighters are coming out of Syria into northern Iraq. And the reason they've made such headway in northern Iraq is because the areas they've moved through are the Sunni areas. That's why, because they are Sunnis coming into ISIS, coming through the Sunni areas, and the main now the stand is being taken by the Kurdish people and also as they start getting into the Shia held areas. But the question is. What are we doing on the diplomatic front? The best, and, uh, the best hope of getting some sort of settlement is to make sure the moderate Sunnis in Iraq support an inclusive government, are included in that government, to split them off from the extremist Sunnis in ISIS. That's what we have to do. It has to be a mission to support that government. And yet we have the current Prime Minister of Iraq, al-Maliki, standing up and saying that the taking of those villages back, which of course we welcome from ISIS in the north, he didn't acknowledge the work of the United States or Australia in bringing weapons. He didn't acknowledge the work um, of the Kurdish people. He said it was a second Kabbalah, a second Kabbalah. Now, if that is not designed to totally ramp up the jihadism, the, the whole absolutely religious confrontation, I don't know what is. How irresponsible was that of El Maliki to say that? And of course, the Kabbalah is the second Kabbalah was referring to a religious war in 680 A.D. That is what we are taking on in Iraq. And so, my question to the Prime Minister is: What is the plan? And I don't believe there is a plan. I think the only plan is go along with the United States, build up the emotional engagement in Australia for taking on ISIS without pointing out to Australians that this could and will lead to a quagmire where we find ourselves very rapidly engaged in another Iraq war with no end and no objective in sight. We should be, at this point, hearing from the government a strategy, but there isn't one. And I condemn absolutely the horrific crimes against humanity that are being carried out in Iraq by ISIS in, in Syria, by ISIS in, uh, by Boko Haram in Nigeria, wherever these are occurring all over the world. But the reason this should come to the parliament, this decision to the parliament, is precisely that, because these are complicated questions, and rather than just try and ridicule People like the Greens who are asking serious questions about strategic outcomes because young Australians will be asked to die, we are being ridiculed because the government seems to have embraced a strategy which says go along with the United States, shoot first and ask the questions later. And that is what we need to be asking those questions right now. Now the Prime Minister has not only responded to the United States' request, but he has said to the United States, you'll never walk alone. Well, I've lived long enough to remember Harold Holt in relation to the Vietnam War saying, all the way with LBJ. And it seems to me that Australia must have an independent foreign policy. This is the Asian century. We must stand and have our independent foreign policy. But instead of that, we are having a repeat of all the way with LBJ with the you'll never walk alone. We have to actually understand, as Major Cantwell has said, what is the point? What is the objective? What is the likelihood of success? What else needs to be in place before you engage in this? And clearly, as I've said, we need diplomatic efforts to make sure that the new government of Iraq is inclusive of all minorities so that you actually dampen jihadism, not actually rev it up, which is what is happening at the moment. Secondly, you need to close, seal that border from Turkey, which is allowing those uh, ISIS um, jihadists and so on to pass through and gain entry. You also need to know who is funding ISIS. They are being funded by governments in the region, including Kuwait, including where, what are the Saudis doing in relation to ISIS. Wahhabism, 
out of Saudi Arabia into the region? What are we doing in terms of a diplomatic arrangement with neighbouring countries and stopping the flow of money which is supplying the ISIS campaign? These are the serious issues, and when I asked about these issues in the parliament, Senator Betts had no answers other than to just ridicule the Greens for asking the questions. They're legitimate questions before you send young men and women into harm's way and before you see a plane being shot down or coffins coming back to Australia. We need to know why it's in the national interest. But we've also had overnight uh, the Prime Minister announcing we'll have an embassy in Kiev. We will, we've been asked for humanitarian and non-lethal assistance in the Ukraine. We're now talking about engaging with civil and military capacity building as a result of our enhanced partnership with NATO. And it seems to me then we have another front with the Prime Minister deciding we're going to sell uranium to India and not making sanctions against the Russians with uranium going into Russia. India is not a signatory to the non-proliferation treaty and is a nuclear power. And when we have the Prime Minister also saying that Japan is Australia's best friend in Asia, when you actually don't announce best friends in a regional context, especially when there is so much tension over the South China Sea. So we've got a Prime Minister who has got himself absolutely now putting Australia out there in conflicts in, in the Ukraine, in Iraq, supporting nuclear in India. What is the plan for Australia with this military engagement? That is what I am asking, and I'm asking it on behalf of the Australian people, and I think this parliament has the right to ask those questions and the right to understand what is Australia's strategic objective in engagement. What is in the national interest in Australia for us to be engaged in the Ukraine? What is it? What is that in Australia's national interest? That is the hard-headed strategic question that the Prime Minister must answer, and he has not answered that question. Now, the legislation that we have here, uh, of course, says that in order to give the parliament this power, the parliament would have to reconvene in a timely manner. Uh, in fact, uh, it says that the, the Governor-General would be able to make a proclamation regarding a declaration of war, provided that Parliament is then recalled within a period of two days. So I'm not suggesting that this matter would be left open-ended, but I am suggesting and am arguing. The Democrats uh, introduced this bill in the mid-1980s. The Greens have embraced it ever since, and we are bringing it here to say that, like the United States, where Congress makes the decision, about the deployment of United States forces, the Australian Parliament should make the decision about the deployment. And I don't think it is doing the national interest very much good to just have this assumption that because the government, totally supported by the Labor Party as a result of confidential briefings, is actually engaged in a mission creep that's going pretty fast within a week. We are now being asked, as I said, being asked by the United States to help with the conflict in Iraq. Australians need to know, because I don't want to have to revisit, as Major Cantwell has done in his book, this question as we see the coffins coming back. Why are we there? What are we hoping to achieve? How long are we there? What is our exit strategy? Had we ever got any hope? Of winning, and if President Obama has said overnight that ISIS can't be defeated, and given the history, the sectarian violence in Iraq, in the region, what is it Australia is seeking to do? What are the risks? What is the objective? That's why the Parliament should be able to debate these matters. If we're going to take on a global role in military engagement. What is Australia's respect or otherwise for international law? Are we going to do it within the framework of international law or are we just going to follow the United States regardless of international law and without the UN Security Council engagement? These are serious matters which warrant serious debate in the parliament and do not, 
It in fact demeans people to see the level of ridicule rather than an engagement of the serious matters. Order. That's Senator, why I support the bill.